Scripture reading is Romans 1, 14 through 17. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in, also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm starting today uh, to preach through uh, the first eight chapters of Romans. And uh, I, I, I have come to uh, look at, especially the first eight chapters of Romans, much like um, many throughout history have found that, that Paul's uh, words uh, of encouragement to the church at Rome are... are some of the most profound um, and contextually all connected together. The first eight chapters don't really have a break in them. It is all one message. Um, there really is a kind of a break from eight to nine, and I'm not really going to do nine through 11. Um, and then from 12 on is, is really about how, what that means for us in practical ways, how we should then behave because of the message uh, that he speaks about in these eight chapters. Um, and, I, and I titled this to those loved by God because that's really what he starts the letter out with after he gives a fairly long description of who is writing. <laughs> um, and we're going to, we'll cover that. But in verse seven, which is the, the, in their form of letters, when they are writing letters to people or to a group, uh, kind of an informal letter, they would identify themselves first, then they would identify who the recipients are, and he identifies them in verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And so... He starts off with, as he did in most of his letters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that essential message of grace and peace is the focus uh, of the, the point of becoming um, his saints, to be called, to be loved. But we're going to start at the beginning and kind of read through the beginning part of it and try to understand how, why he takes so many verses to um, describe why he's writing and who he's writing for. Um, but I titled this section, and this is just my own title of his message, because I actually picture the first eight chapters as essentially a sermon. Um, I think of it like a word of exhortation that Paul himself was asked to do and to give to uh, synagogues as they traveled around. Uh, when he would be in a synagogue visiting, they would ask him, do you have a, a word of exhortation? And he would get up and speak it uh, to the people. Um, the book of Hebrews is called uh, a word of exhortation and the book of Hebrews as well. Uh, is written almost like it's a sermon and uh, it really doesn't have it flows completely it doesn't really have little sections that are all distinct from one another um, and so I titled it Jesus Rescue Me because that's ultimately I think the point is, of the whole eight chapters is that we need work to be rescued by Jesus and it's the purpose and the reason why the gospel was needed, uh, where he starts what's already been read for us in, in, uh, from 14 to 17. The purpose of the gospel, its function, but why? Why do we need it? And so it starts there and it ends with our glory in him. And all through, from, it, from why we need the gospel of Christ to why he gave himself, and why we need God's grace, 
and, and ultimately what that then means for us to live in his glory is really one message. It's not, it's not a bunch of different messages. And very often, and I would say now for about 10 years, I've really been, I've really in my own studies, I've been very focused on trying to understand a bigger picture to put all of the teachings of scripture into a context. Um, and to, because very often I find it, and I, thinking back throughout my life uh, in studying the Bible, sometimes we study a portion of the Bible and we, you know, we really get that, but it's a little piece of it. And we don't necessarily connect it to every other little piece of it. Um, you know, the Proverbs that tells us to not overstay our welcome, you know, with, with a neighbor or, or somebody else. Um, and so different people might def define that, what overstaying the welcome is. But um, why, why is that little verse in there? Why is that little verse important? Why is that verse important for our walk in, in, with Christ? And so understanding that all scripture has a big purpose in mind. It has a big purpose of our unity with God to walk with him here on this world, in this world, on this planet, but ultimately to live with him in glory eternally. And all of what he has told us all has that focus. And so sometimes we, we, people get caught up religiously in, in bits and pieces of it and, and don't sometimes remember to plug it into the whole. Why it's there? Why are, why are we learning this little thing or that little thing or doing this thing or that thing? Um, because sometimes it's easier just to have you know, simple things to do. But those simple things all build up to something much bigger and more glorious. Um, and, but it doesn't matter about learning to not overstay our welcome if we don't ultimately realize that we need salvation. It, a lot of the details of Scripture without Christ and us willing to humble ourselves, realizing we need to be saved and He needs to save us, a lot of the other stuff is just, you know, it's rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, right? And so sometimes people get caught up in, in, in rituals, but we really need to understand where is this all going? And I think, I don't, in terms of scripture, I don't think any, there's no place in scripture that I think completely describes that as well as Paul's first eight chapters of the Romans. So let's kind of get into, I'll give you an overview here and I'm not going to be going through more slides. This is really just Paul's chapter one, which I titled Paul's obligation to preach the gospel. Um, very often, the kind of the theme verse, most people, when they think of the book of Romans, they actually pick out 16 and 17 from not ashamed of the gospel. But I actually think it comes up in a couple of verses before that, where Paul himself said, I'm obligated to preach the gospel. And because when it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, that word for means sort of because, therefore. That's, that's a connection to what he just said before that. And he says, I'm obligated to preach the gospel, which he was. We see that he was called very specifically by Christ for that purpose. He communicated with uh, the other apostles in Jerusalem, and they recognized that they were going to uh, the Jews. They had 12 of them to go to the Jews, but he was going to the Gentiles. And that was his job. He understood it. And he lived it, and he practiced it until he died. And so the, Paul's obligation to preach the gospel is the background for the entire message of these eight chapters. And so we're going to read a little bit about the intro, his purpose, uh, why he was wanting to go to Rome and, and help them, um, why he was obligated a little bit, but also because of his obligation to preach the gospel, um, because it is the power of God to save everyone. And so 
Then he then describes why do we need a gospel to save us? And that's really what the second half of the first chapter is about. Why do we all need that? So let's go kind of start in here in the first six verses. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, I, I do want you to notice that essentially this is all one sentence. <laughs> okay? It's all connected. And, and so Paul, the writer is Paul. He's a servant of Christ who was called to be an apostle by Christ, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, referring to the Old Testament. And he's saying all of the promises about Jesus, about the son, he goes, and this all came from him, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and it was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is his long, I believe his longest introduction to any of his letters. Some of them have very short ones, some of them have a little bit longer ones. And it's all about him and Christ. Him serving Christ. That is what he was called for. That was his life's mission. That is what he tried to do. And... In this letter he's sending to them, that's all of this letter comes as part of that mission. And so it, it, there's just so many little details in there. You can actually spend a lot of time going to other passages and looking up and finding, you know, all the, the scriptures uh, uh, in the Old Testament about Jesus. And I mean, those, those are all there's a lot of study in all of that by itself. Uh, being a descendant of David according to the flesh, um, which he, he makes very clear that he's not, not according to his spirit. His spirit was something different, but his flesh was through David, from Abraham and Adam. But after saying all of that, he, he gives us a little introduction before he really gets into it, and that he comes in 8 through... Uh, 15 he says first i thank my god through jesus christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world for god is my witness whom i serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing i mention you always in my prayers asking that somehow by god's will i may now uh, at last succeed in coming to you for i long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both, both yours and mine. Now, there's an interesting thing about why would he have all of this interest in, in, in Christians in Rome? And by the way, Paul has already known Christians from Rome. Uh, who came out of there, who some, of, some of them were kicked out of there, whom uh, he spent time with and ministered with and served in other parts as he traveled around you know, Greece and Macedonia and, and Asia. Um, he worked with many who had lived there. Uh, and so he knew about Rome. Obviously, everybody in the world knew about Rome. But... There were Christians there, and, and yet it appears as if there had not been, to this point of his writing, any of the apostles to have gotten there to have helped establish that church, to have laid hands on people to impart the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so they were a whole group of Christians, probably had some teachers, and maybe even some prophets, but they were without some of the leadership that the church had in the first century. And so he had been wanting to get there. He'd been longing to get there. He wanted to help them. 
And so he writes this letter from Corinth uh, at the end of all of his missionary journeys in and around uh, the eastern part of the Mediterranean. And right before he leaves there and goes to Rome, now he eventually does get to Rome, but he just ends up taking a long time as a prisoner. Um, but his goal was to get back to Jerusalem, give Jerusalem saints all of the money he had collected on his most recent you know, journeys, and then to leave to go to Rome. But in the meantime, he got arrested and then ended up going as a prisoner. But he still got there. Uh, and this letter was a, a way of introducing himself to all of them and to his arrival. So, and he, say, and he goes, I, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, in verse 13, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Um, and, and that's an interesting kind of opening line to, pre to preaching the gospel, isn't it? I'm not ashamed of it. It almost implies that there is already, as he's writing this, there's a certain maybe shame quality coming from the world about the message of Christ. Remember, they're serving a, a, a master and a leader whom Rome has executed as a wrongdoer. <laughs> That's their great Messiah. And so it's a very interesting kind of opening. I'm not ashamed of it. And, and I think the world often makes us feel ashamed of it. That we have to remember, as Paul did, you know, because of the gospel of Christ is why he was arrested not long after this. The people who arrested him in Jerusalem used to many of them be his friends. They were his compatriots. They were his fellow leaders in, Ro in Jerusalem. And now he's their worst enemy. They hate him more than all the other apostles because he used to be one of them. And, and the only thing that changed is he began to preach the gospel that before he was persecuting. And so if he didn't want to be persecuted, he, all he had to do was stop preaching the gospel. But he wouldn't do that. He was obligated he was called for that reason, specifically by Jesus. And so he says, I'm not ashamed of it. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And this is a really interesting point. You know, sometimes we think that it is our ability to talk with other people that is their salvation. We're going to save other people because we're going to bring to them the Bible and we're going to instruct them and we're going to teach them. But the reality is the thing that really turns hearts and minds of people is Scripture itself, not my thoughts on it. Now, my thoughts as a teacher might help. They might help you know, inform, instruct. But I didn't come up with this message. I didn't invent it. I didn't plan it. <laughs> And I, I just do my best to try and learn it. To try and help impart knowledge that I learn. None of us have the power for salvation. And so people read scriptures and are often moved. And, and that's by God's design, by His power. And it's for everyone who's going to believe in God. He says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So whether you're Jewish or whether... So, so we might think sometimes, you know, like what, what does a Jewish person who, who, who's not a Christian, who does not believe Jesus is their Messiah, what do they need? They need the Scriptures. They need the Gospel just like everybody else. 
What does somebody who's you know gone to church all their life, what do they need? They need the gospel, just like everybody else. Everybody needs the gospel. Everybody needs to read the gospel, to have the scriptures be something that we become familiar with. Because it is God's power imparted to save us and to change us and affect us. He says in verse 17, For in it, talking about the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And, and, and here's the thing. Probably more than any other religious writings that exist in, hu- in all of humanity, if you go and read, and, I, you know, and I've, I've read a lot of, and I've studied a lot of religious uh, writings in my lifetime, and most of them have some human being who's really great. Right? I mean, somebody who's just really special whom you have to try to become like. But the, but the Word of God doesn't have that. The, I mean, the greatest people in scriptures, let, let's leave Jesus out for a moment because he's ultimately shown to not just be another human being. M- Moses, do we describe all of his failures? Moses is a murderer. David, we don't want to... We don't want to start listing all the things he did that were horrible. I mean, all the way through, there's almost no, like, people that you would say, wow, these are just the, these are the the pinnacle of what it means to be faithful and good. As we read through, like, Hebrews chapter 11, all those, and sometimes people kind of refer to it as kind of the hall of fame of faith. Go through that list and And think about all the terrible things you know some of these people did. (laughs) Have you done all the things or any of the things some of them did? Most of us haven't. Because there is no human being, and I emphasize the human being, (laughs) there is no human being who is not without sin. And scriptures make that abundantly clear. The only one who's righteous is God, not man. And that's why he needed to rescue us. And that's what he goes through in a fairly long way in a number of chapters demonstrating why Jesus needs to rescue us. He says, and so, and that righteousness of God, it is revealed from faith for faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So he's quoting the Old Testament when he's talking about this idea of living by faith. That this isn't a new idea. This is an old idea. This is exactly what he told the Jews as well. So he then says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to save everyone who who will believe. And he says, because, and this is where 18 starts, because the wrath of God is revealed. Now, we already talked about the righteousness of God being revealed, right? What does he then say right after that? Why do we need to hear the gospel and to be saved from it? Because his righteousness is revealed. But in that same revelation, we also learn of his wrath. And he says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, we're going to describe what essentially God hates. And and we shouldn't misunderstand this. Um, And I think as if you're ever parents, and for those who have been parents, you you probably have a, a sense of this with children. Um, maybe even raising children. Uh, you could be taking care of children. There are, there are mistakes children make that might frustrate you a little bit and you're trying to teach them. But the things you hate is when they get really stubborn and obstinate. 
and you tell them, no, don't do that, and you're trying to teach them to not touch the hot plate because it will burn you and maybe leave a scar on your flesh. But they don't want to listen to you and they want to disobey and do it anyway because in part, part of them is like, I don't want to do what you told me to do. That part frustrates parents more than any other. And that, that sense of disobedience, that sense of stiff-necked, as the scriptures call it, is a thing God hates too. It's why in order to ultimately be saved, we have to become obedient and humble listeners of God. Understanding He is our Creator, our Father, and we are all His offspring. And if we, we will never please Him if we are stubborn and self-centered. And so he's saying, we learn about the righteousness of God from Scripture. We also learn about the wrath of God. And it's against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It isn't just that they did wrong. And this is where the book, uh, this particular section, when it's describing sin, this is, this is the little bit of a turn. It isn't that that you just didn't do the right thing. It's that you then turned and you suppressed everybody else from doing the right thing. You made it. You purposely made it harder. And he says, and I don't, I don't mean you specifically, but human beings. This is what human beings have done. And so they suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world when we go back into the early into the book of Genesis and we read about Adam and his children even you know, Cain, that, that terrible person who kills his brother. He still knows God. He understands there is a God. He's upset when God punishes him for killing his brother. They knew things about God, and yet they hid them. They obfuscated them. They did everything they could to try and not do them. Does that sound like any children you know? <laughs> who, who you're, you, ever have, you ever have rules in your household where you have just kind of a plain rule and then you know, that, that rule has to get a lot bigger and longer in order to kind of address all of the... Um, ways that they figured out a way to get around around it i've used the example before and I'll, I'll just use it again because i think it's a good one but yeah because it, it really applies to most of us you know you're told clean your room right and we know we as a parent clean your room means all of it we mean under the bed we mean in your closet we don't mean pile it all up into one place and stuff it under the bed. That's not what's meant by clean your room. But we have to eventually get specific about that because every kid at some point is told to clean their room and they go and make it look nice. But they've hidden all of the trash. They've hidden all of the mess. And they didn't clean it. They just collected it and stored it. And then you have to go, well, okay, when I mean clean the room, I mean this and that. And you have to get all, you have to give all the details. That's not much different than God. God's basic rule was love him and love each other. But then he had to get a lot more specific because we go, well, I don't know. Do you, have you seen some of these people you put me with? They're not that lovable. Do I have to love him? Are you sure he's my neighbor? 
And so almost all the other commandments are there to explain how to love God and how to love your neighbor. Because we as disobedient children try to figure out a way to do those two things really easy in a nice self-centered way that I don't have to think about others too much. And so we become very much this idea that we try to hide and obfuscate the plain truths of God. Even though we can see, he said, from the very beginning, people have known about his power, about his creation. And he says, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Now, here's a really interesting thing. Even before any scriptures were written down, he said they were without excuse. There was enough evidence about God and the Creator, and there are things you could know that already eliminated the excuse for you to not be godly, to you to not seek and after those things that are true and right. And so, and I think that's generally true. I, th I think if you just look at people, even people who, who don't believe in God, they still believe in right and wrong. I haven't met a single atheist who, who believes and doesn't believe in, it's like, well, you just do whatever you can get away with. That, that, hardly any of them ever say that. I haven't met or read or, or heard any of them make that point. They still believe in right and wrong. You shouldn't murder. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Well, why? If we're just a product, if we're just product of nothing and it's just kind of random chance, do whatever you can get away with. Isn't that what most animals do? They do that until another animal kills them? <laughs> but that's not what people believe because human beings have an innate sense of right and wrong. And we know that because you yourself have your own conscience and you know you've done things that you think are wrong. So has everybody else who doesn't even believe in God. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Notice that they went from enlightened to darkened. They actually moved away from God. I don't want to know God's way. I want to do it my way. That is the natural human tendency. And I think you see that. And every single one of us has done that since we were little kids. We didn't want others telling us what to do. Even though they knew more and understood more. That's humans. And we can become darkened in our understanding. We can claim to be wise and become fools. And exchange the glory of the immortal God. Exchanging, it's like here is the glory of God. And now some people want to glorify the creation. The stars or the earth or animals or people. We're not glorious. The one who made it is glorious. Well, I'm, I'm going to kind of pick, leave off here. I think I'll go ahead. kind of want to hit the end of the chapter, but I'll, I'll it, there's still too much. I've kind of gone already long enough. I'll go from here into chapter two next week. We'll, we'll finish off this part about um, why we need to be saved because his righteousness has been revealed. His wrath has been revealed. And specifically his wrath against our disobedience. Being sons of disobedience. Being, and that really means children of his that don't want to do what he said. And we need to overcome that. Because that's actually at the heart of all of us to some degree. Almost all of us have at a certain point, like, I just want to do what I want to do. And that's a dangerous, dangerous thing if we want to seek and walk with God. We'll, we'll leave it there uh, this morning. We'll continue on next week, um, and I'll probably get through chapter 2 next week. But um, 
if you're thinking about this idea of, of God's wrath or of his salvation and realize, you know, if you're not feeling confident that, you know, you have returned to him, that you have come to him, you've been baptized in him, that you were raised in Christ, we be glad to help you understand what the scripture says about those things, about how Jesus rescues us, how he saves us, how his grace was given to us to lift us up. And if you don't understand those things, we are here to try and help you. Um, but also in anything else, if you are suffering in some way, if you're hurting in some way, if you have needs in something, we also want you to reach out to us. We're going to go ahead and sing uh, the Sands of Time to close out this portion of our uh, morning services. But if you're in need, please reach out to us. Uh, and if you need to, let the whole congregation know. Please go ahead and let us know as we stand and sing.